The title of the sermon today is What Angers God, which doesn't uh, uh, necessarily present a positive, but I think you'll see at the end of it that it's very positive. Uh, what we're going to discover is that because God loves us so much, it angers God when we stubbornly doubt him. Because he loves us so much, it angers God when we stubbornly doubt him. There is, um, there is a malady called borderline personality disorder. We've actually, uh, we've actually had that within the church family here. And those who uh, suffer with borderline personality disorder, um, and it's usually from childhood trauma of some kind, uh, what happens in, in their soul is they find it difficult to believe that people in their life really love them and are committed to them. And so when they enter into a relationship, initially uh, that person is, who shows interest in them, shows them care, is perfect and uh, does everything just perfectly. But then the first time they do something negative, then they're the worst person in the world. And the borderline harbors this suspicion that this other person is looking for a way to get out of the relationship. And so oftentimes, though they're being, they really are loved and cared for, they sabotage the relationship. And so, as you can imagine, this isn't something that they have chosen. This is, this is something that's the result of trauma in their lives that has shaped their soul, where they struggle to believe that people love them and care about them and are committed to them. And as a result, it's somewhat of a self-fulfilling situation where they sabotage the relationship and kind of prove that suspicion that they harbor in their hearts. And it's uh, difficult at best for them to form relationships, if not, in most cases, impossible. You know, I think sometimes uh, God feels like some of us are borderlines. In that he loves us with a love that we cannot comprehend, nor can the human tongue express how much God loves us and how committed he is to us. And yet there are some of us who really struggle to believe that. And particularly when adversity hits, we then interpret that adversity as an indication that God has abandoned us, that God, in fact, does not love us. Because if he was a loving God, he would have not allow this to happen. We see this in the life of the nation of Israel. And in fact, this is what God addresses in Psalm 95 as we look here at this psalm that was probably sung during the feasts of the Lord when Israel would come up to Jerusalem and to the temple the three times a year and they would worship the Lord together corporately in the temple area. They would come into the presence of the Lord. And here in Psalm 95 is an invitation for them to come together and to worship the Lord together, to praise Him for who He is, to give thanks for what He has done for them. But then in the second half of this psalm, there's a very severe warning where God breaks in, and we'll see it, where God kind of breaks in on the psalmist and He warns Israel not to be like the anse their ancestors who continued to relate to God with stubborn unbelief. After all God had done for them, and we'll see this, they still questioned whether God was with them. They questioned whether God was really committed to them, even though they had seen Him supernaturally deliver them, even though they saw God supernaturally providing for them, and yet there was this stubborn, obstinate unbelief that remained. And that's what angered God. It angered God because God wants his people to know what? That he loves them. That he's committed to them. For them to walk in the freedom and the joy and the peace and the productivity of knowing that you are cared for and loved 
and God is with you and God is for you rather than staying in this obstinate doubt. Now let's read together Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let's make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." So God speaks clearly here about his wrath, about loathing a generation, the Exodus generation, being angry with that generation. And so what angers God? Well, as you see in your notes, it makes God angry when we doubt his love for us. It makes God angry when we doubt his love for us because he so deeply wants us to know and understand and live in the light of his love for us. Now, as you notice in Psalm 95, it begins with this upbeat invitation to come and to worship the Lord, right? To come into his presence in Jerusalem and in the temple and uh, with the, uh, the orchestra and the choir and, and uh, your fellow Israelites and to be led by the priests in this wonderful worship and singing and make a joyful noise to the Lord. What is, what is a joyful noise to the Lord? It's singing, but it's all, well, and so some of us, that's okay. But, um, but it's also clapping, right? It's also clapping. It's snapping your fingers. It's saying, woo, you know, and, it's, and you can just see these thousands of people being led, and they're singing together, and they're just having a wonderful time worshiping the Lord. And, and we see this, this invitation for them to come up at the feast and to worship the Lord with joy and gladness and thanksgiving, worship Him for who He is. What he has done for them as the nation of Israel. And then it's almost, when you come to the verse 7, halfway through verse 7, it's like the needle scrapes across the record. It's like God steps in and takes the microphone away from the, the psalmist and says, And now, listen up. And he delivers this warning to each generation who comes up to worship him in Jerusalem and at the temple. And what is that warning? He says, today, if you hear his voice, and here we would understand that to mean that as part of their worship at the Feast of the Lord, the scriptures would be read. The scriptures would be read by the scribes. They would have teaching that would come from the scriptures, from the Torah. It would be teaching that had to do with the Mosaic Covenant and their relationship with God and God's will for them and instructions for how they are to live. And he's saying, so today, gathered together as we are, worshiping the Lord, and then we have a time of instruction. If you hear his voice, as he's speaking to you from the scriptures, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. And here, God is warning them not to do what their ancestors did. And their ancestors specifically are the Exodus generation, that generation that were liberated from Egypt and brought into the Sinai. He's saying, don't do what they did at Meribah and Massa. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And you need to understand what he says, they will not enter my rest, that the land of Canaan 
was referred to as the rest. That when they would take possession of the land of Canaan and be settled in their towns and villages, in their homes and their farms, and they would rest from military combat and conflict with their pagan neighbors, then they would experience what God calls his rest. They would be in possession of the land, secure possession of the land. And God said about the Exodus generation, they will not enter my rest. They will not enter the promised land. Now what happened at Meribah and Massah? Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Exodus chapter 17. Now as we begin reading here, let's put it in its historical context These folks, about which we are reading, have just recently crossed the Red Sea on dry land. These people about whom we are reading have just begun to be fed from heaven with manna. Six days a week they go outside and on the ground is the food that sustains them and I imagine their livestock as well. So they've just come across the Red Sea on dry ground. They're being fed by manna miraculously every day. And then we pick up the story in Exodus 17, verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people there, but the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Isn't it interesting then, through Psalm 95, God references this event and he says, don't be like your ancestors. They saw his work on their behalf. Think about it with me. What had this generation experienced at the hand of God? that would prove that he was committed to them, that he cared about them, that he loved them. What had he done for, what had he done for this generation? Part of the Red Sea and prior to that, what, when they were still in slavery in Egypt, what did they experience? The plagues. What did they experience the night that they left Egypt? The Passover. Their children, their firstborn, were spared. Miraculously, when their Egyptian neighbors were all crying because their firstborn were slain. Over and over again, God had shown his love and commitment and his care and provision for these people. And yet, when they thirsted for water, when they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord with us or not? that's not a question. That's a statement. God, you've abandoned us. You see, that's that stubborn, obstinate doubt and unbelief expressed toward God who had given them ample, overwhelming evidence of his commitment to them. Was it true that they did not have adequate water at Rephidim? Yes. But what would faith look like in that situation? It would be to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, we know you love us. You know what our need is. We need water. 
Lord, we're waiting upon you. Rather than saying, are you with us or not? I guess you aren't because there isn't one in water here. Which is what their attitude was. An obstinate, stubborn unbelief, a doubt of God's love and provision and care because they were in need. And this is what angered God. And the low point, did you guys like this? Okay. I'm not going to do that again. That's just, that's just not right. The low point of their stubborn doubt was at Kadesh Barnea, and we studied this a few weeks ago, when they listened to the report of the ten spies, and they doubted God's ability to bring them into the land of promise. That was the low point. And that's referred to here when he said, it was at that point, Numbers 14, where God said, you will not go, this generation will not go into the land. You will not inherit my rest. You will die. The Sinai will be your grave. It angers God when his people do not trust his love, particularly after he has shown himself faithful and loving. Now, folks, we all have doubt. That's not what angers God. Honest, honest doubt does not anger God because we all start there, right, to some degree. And what I'm calling innocent, honest doubt is 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 where we start in our relationship with God, but over time, as we trust Him, as He proves Himself faithful, our faith grows deeper, it gets stronger, and that doubt begins to fade away, and we become convinced that God is with us, He's for us, He loves us. When we're in adversity, we look to Him. That doesn't anger God. What angers God is this stubborn, obstinate, we've seen God work over and over and over again, and yet we still question him. And I think the way I process this is because God is love, he's not peevish like I am. When I get frustrated and sometimes I interpret, let me just tell you what it is, okay? (laughs) Kathy and I will have a discussion and maybe we'll receive an invitation to go to somebody's house or go to this event. And We'll talk about it and we'll agree and we'll say, yes, on such and such a date, we're going to do this. Well, then as the date approaches, Kathy says, "Uh, honey, are we still going to go to this? And just something inside me starts to, amen, thank you for one honest man. (laughs) It's like, we talked about this, we agreed to it, I agreed to it, why are you questioning me, right? Right? Come on, you guys are so di- uh, unbelievably dishonest. <laughs> All the guys on Friday morning understood what I was saying, right, Jimmy Piva? All right? That's probably why we all like each other, is we all have the same kind of psycho problems. But that's just being peevish on my part, right? Because that's just, she's being relational, she's just, you know, looking for that confirmation and so on. She's not questioning my integrity or anything like that, but that's just, you know, God's not peevish. God's not peevish that way. But he is a God who intensely desires that we walk in the confidence and the peace and joy of knowing we are loved. And we can trust him and we can count on him. And I think that's what leads or what is behind that anger when we are obstinate and stubborn and we just continue to doubt him. That's what troubles the Lord. Isn't it interesting that in the invitation to worship the Lord is the solution to doubt? Let's go back to verses 1 through 7. And again, isn't it wonderful that we don't have to go to Jerusalem and just three times a year, but rather we're gathering every Sunday together to corporately worship the Lord. But here's the answer to our doubt. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. That's what we're to be doing when we come together to corporately worship the Lord. And I, I hope you, you have freedom. We, sure, we have a wonderful praise team. I love the music. I love the, the lyrics, the depth of the lyrics and the quality of the music. And, and I hope you have the freedom to make a joyful noise. I hope you have the freedom to raise your hands and to clap and to whoop when it's time to whoop. And in second service, we have Gail Edwards over here, and she's just dancing to the Lord, and it is so cool. And I hope you feel that freedom. I hope you have the, feel the freedom not to if that's not your personality. But there's freedom in this place because we want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And then he goes on and he says, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. Excuse me, also the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. And so what are we to be praising the Lord? When we come together, what are we to be praising the Lord for who he is? That he is the creator and the king of all that he has created. And by the way, I'm excited for those of you that are going to the Grand Canyon next weekend because you're going to see the handiwork of the Lord. And I hope and I trust that that will deepen your faith. But let's think about that. When are we most prone to doubt God's loving care for us? When we go through a hard time, when adversity hits. Now let me ask you, God is the creator and the king of all that he has made. In fact, the scriptures reveal that in Christ, the one through whom the Father made all things, the Lord Jesus, by the power of his word, holds all things together. I believe he holds the atoms together out of which the entire universe is made. Now let me ask you that. If that is our God, who is a creator king, is there anything too difficult for him? <laughs> is there anything that you are facing that he is not able to deal with? Yes or no? And so even in our worship is the solution to our doubt that we are worshiping the Creator King. There's nothing too difficult for Him. Nothing that we're going to face in this life that He cannot deal with. And we know that His heart of love for us, He will always do what is right and good. And so even as we gather together on Sunday mornings, we should be building each other's faith such that when adversity hits, this is where our minds go. We ponder, we think about, we go back and we cling to the one who is the creator and the king of the universe. And there we find our peace. That he is with us and there is nothing too difficult for him. Now some of us might say, well, that's all well and good, but will he do that for me? Does he love me? And I think the answer to that is in the next part of the invitation, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Now, in this context, the psalmist is calling the nation of Israel to come and to praise and give thanks to God for the unique relationship into which he has called them. They are the chosen people. He called them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel has a unique relationship with God. They continue to have a unique relationship with God. And the psalmist encourages them to come and to celebrate the fact that God has chosen them and brought them into this unique relationship where he is their shepherd and they are his flock. That God has chosen them. Now the church is not Israel. We are the church and yet we have been called by God into a unique relationship with him. In Christ, we have a unique relationship with God. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And so if God has called each one and drawn each one of us into this relationship with him, then does he care for you? Does he love you? Is he committed to you? Absolutely. He has made a covenant with you, the new covenant. He has made with each one of us who are trusting in Christ as our Savior. And so on the one hand, he's the creator God. Nothing is too difficult for him. 
And on the other hand, he has chosen you and brought you into a unique relationship with himself. Uh, Turn with me to Ephesians, to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Now, as you're turning there, I'm going to be encouraging us that when we find ourselves tempted to doubt whether God is with us, to ask ourselves two questions. First of all, is God able? Whatever we're facing, is God able? How do we know that he's able? He is the creator king. And then the second question for us to ask ourselves is, does he care? And the answer to that is, yes, he chose me. Look with me at Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us For adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. He has chosen you to be holy and blameless in his sight. He predestined you to be his sons and daughters in Christ. Does he care about you? Is he committed to you? Does he love you? All right, so when, when you're facing that adversity or that doubt creeps in, first question you ask is, is God able? And the answer is, he's the creator king. Does he care? Yes, he chose you. You have a unique relationship. He has drawn you into that unique relationship. And so don't doubt. Trust him. Now, I also want to say this before we end with Romans 8. You might want to go ahead and turn there, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to pick up in verse 26. But there's another aspect to this. We are prone to doubt in times of adversity. But Psalm 95 also challenges God's people that as they are hearing the instruction from God's word, how are they to respond? in faith and obedience. You know, the same is true for us. When we come together and we worship and we have a great time together on Sunday mornings and we celebrate our great God and King, we celebrate the Lord Jesus, we praise God for what he's done in calling us to himself. And then when the word of God is taught, what does God desire of us? That we respond in faith and obedience. We may not be going through adversity, but God is teaching us a principle. God is teaching something that we need to act on and apply in our lives. And this applies as much to the positive, proactive response of faith and obedience to the teaching of God's word that we engage in every Sunday. Does that make sense? That when you hear today, when you hear his word, when you hear his word in the message, whether I'm bringing it, Phil, Nate, someone else is bringing the word of God, how are we to respond to his word when we hear it? Trust and obey. Apply it to our lives. Be obedient to what God's word has revealed to us and taught us that day. But in closing this morning, here's what I'm really concerned about. I'm concerned that we grow deeper in our faith, in our conviction, in our knowing that God loves us and we do not need to doubt him. Look with me at Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for you. He is not against you. He is for you. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Has God done anything to show you how much he loves you? What has he done? God so loved you that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? You understand, there isn't any sin that you are committing or can commit in the future that will bring a condemning word from God, that will cause God to reject you. It's not possible. Why? Because all of our sin, say it with me, past, present, and future, all of our sin was paid for by the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross. So there's nothing that can separate you from God. God will never reject you. God will never kick you out again. You are his. You are completely, utterly, absolutely forgiven and restored to a relationship with God for all eternity. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now hear this. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. (laughs) Folks, God loves you. God loves me. He's proven that. And so if we ever are tempted to doubt that, Whether it's because of adversity, let's resolve that. Is God able? Yes, he's a creator king. Does God care? Yes, he chose me. (laughs) Does he love me? Yes, with a love I can't comprehend. He loves me. So do I need to doubt him? No. Don't doubt the one who loves you so much that he gave his own son to come and die that you might be with him forever. Let's pray together. Father, help us through the power of your Holy Spirit and the truth of your word to embrace deep within each one of our souls your great love for us. I pray for any here who are not yet reconciled to you by faith in Jesus that your spirit would enable them to understand and to place their faith that you love them that when Jesus died on the cross he suffered and took the punishment for our sin every bit of it 
so that we can be completely and absolutely forgiven and be made right with you. Father, for those of us who have trusted in Christ, that that, that sense, that perception of your love would deepen and become richer and play a greater and greater part in our daily lives, in our thinking, in our attitudes, and in our living. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's going to be warm out there, so uh, take the necessary precautions. The Lord bless you as you go and serve him this week.